Welcome to our Indie Street Chat. The members of Bloodhound Picks and an occasional guest give their no BS experiences with current aspects of the industry for people looking to break in or make their own production company. Um, it's perseverance. You know, to always yeah. just have almost like a blind faith in what you're doing and just, you know, keep pushing on because you are going to get knockbacks, you know, continuously. Yeah. And that's just not like exclusive to, you know, people like us who are kind of just kind of starting out and trying to make our ways, you know, even Clint Eastwood famously was told, you know, you're never going to make it. So it's just to have that kind of confidence in, in what you're doing and and just to, to, to push through. And it's tough, you know, truly tough to, to yeah. have that. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of why we want to tell stories and everything, you know, why we want to bring our imagination to life. Um, there's a certain amount of confidence already. You know, it's still there. So I think that's uh, that's kind of the key to it is, is perseverance, really. You know, it's just push on through and to always have faith in what you're doing and, and just, uh, you know, forget the haters. That's the, yeah. That's the kids. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, before we, I guess, dive deeper, do you want to kind of talk about your you know, history up until now. You know, yeah, yeah, certainly. So, I mean, I mean, my background is mainly in acting. I've been acting since I was you know, five years old. So I've done a variety of stuff from film and television. Um, I, was, I, I was in a pretty successful show in England for seven years. Um, it's a TV show called Grain Chill, and it's actually the longest-running children's drama. Um, so I was a main role in that series regular. And I kind of grew up in the public eye. Um, after leaving that show, you know, I did various things. Uh, ended up moving out to Los Angeles, where um, I was fortunate enough to meet Craig and uh, kind of continue um, working within the realms of the industry. Um, I work with a company called Man Monster, as these guys did. I helped to kind of uh, develop that company and... Um, and I do so much work with them anymore. They they do a lot of conventions across uh, the US. Um, but my, my first and foremost love has always been uh, cinema and movies and films. Um, and I have a, a great you know passion for the horror genre. That's you, Craig. Mate. Yeah. I've spoken many yeah. times about it. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much my background. Um, okay. I do consider myself a cinephile, but occasionally I meet people who are you know, a lot more educated on cinema than I am. <laughs> but it's, it's always nice to chat film with people. Thanks. And then, um, so what was it like, I guess, moving from what you were doing in England and then the transition into the States and LA? And yeah, it was, how was that it was process? Tough. I mean, initially, I, I followed a girl. Um, that's why I went out to Los Angeles. The, the girl was also from England. She became my wife, and now we got a little American baby in our hands. Um, but initially, like the first year, I think was was super tough because I, I quickly realised that you know, oh, you're not so fucking special. You know, everyone wants to be an actor, and especially in this day and age, you know, when we all have the ability to make movies in our pockets. When I was growing up as a kid, you know, I'd make movies with my friends, we'd buy camcorders and we'd shoot these movies and edit them, but now you have that ability to do so, you know, literally in your pocket, and um, it, it, quite, it, it was a sinking realisation, I thought, that I wasn't so, I guess, unique or special, because in England, you know, you tell people you're an actor, and they don't believe you. you know, it's just like a fantasy to them. Like, you're talking rubbish. What, you know, what are you talking about? Are you an actor? That's, that's, that's for the realms of fantasy. Um, and then hitting LA, um, it became you know, very apparent and obvious to me that everybody 
is an actor or <laughs> has some sort of connection to the industry. So it was a little bit disheartening at first, but then, you know, the, the reason I, I met Craig, I'm not sure if you guys know, <coughs> Craig and I worked at the Chinese Theatre in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, so when I, when I found myself working there, and I do actually still work there because I love it so much, it became a, you know, a point of grounding. You know, I had something to kind of call my own, and, and it, 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 it was a great move for me, you know, on the chessboard of life. Okay. And then, so did you kind of move to, because I know you do music and you write as well. So when you came out to um, LA for the acting and then kind of went on and then with the Chinese theater, did you then move to, like, how do you use other outlets or well, I think I initially came with that, with that blind confidence I was speaking about before, you know, that blind yeah. confidence of just being like, you know, I'm, I'm special and nobody's quite like me. And I still have that to an extent, but it's, it's certainly lessened over the years. I've, I've realized and understood that, you know, I think a major turning point for me, I watched a documentary called Senna. I don't know if you guys have seen that one. It's, by, it's about Ayrton Senna, who was a race car driver. And um, it's a fascinating documentary, but he was literally putting his life on the line to entertain a country. And I was thinking to myself, after I watched that, I was like, what are you, what are you doing? You're not, <laughs> you know, this is not rocket science. Entertainment is not rocket science. You're not saving lives here. You're not doing anything kind of that profound. And certainly when you look at all these other people around you who are, you know, doing web series and, and um, you know, short movies and things, you, you kind of you just lose a little bit of that passion. So you kind of think to yourself, it's, it's kind of, you know, let's, let's pretend. It's kid stuff, really. And even though it's fun and enjoyable, it is let's pretend. Um, but that's, that's to a certain extent. So um, you, you've also got people who are making serious um, movies with serious subject matters and, in, and issues that are being raised within them. So you know, I don't want to belittle the, the people who are doing those sort of things. But certainly from my point of view, I, I did get that sense quite early on after moving out to L.A. that, you know, you're not so special. So that blind confidence kind of like was diluted a little. Bit. Oh, thanks. Um, so since I know that you're a well, kind of a new father, and uh, another one, um, did that kind of change anything in terms of your career or in terms of your acting, or uh, it changed my ability to watch movies. <laughs> no, hopefully you don't get to watch as many films as I want to watch and enjoy as many movies as I want to watch um, also you know speaking specifically about the, the horror genre you know I, I've developed a different relationship to that particular genre since becoming a father where you know things that are subject matter wise too dark you know I might kind of shy away from a little bit or or things that are gratuitous in nature you know i'm like not as interested in as i might have been you know exploitive stuff you know five or six years ago i'd, I'd seek out the most kind of disturbing stuff i'd always be looking up like top five disturbing movies ever made and i'd like to challenge myself to see if i could <laughs> sit through them. nowadays i don't think i'm really looking for that anymore because i've seen some pretty sick shit <laughs> over the years and I'm just like yeah I, I don't think I can see anything sicker than that and being a father I don't think maybe I should look at this sort of stuff anymore it's, it's definitely not um, entertaining you know <laughs> I mean I know from, you know from personal experience even I mean the ridiculous one for me is at um, what was it Busan? Like I watched it when it first came out, 
It's like, okay, yeah, zombie movie, it, it was good. I want to move forward. I just rewatched it a few months ago. And it oddly hit me at a, on an emotional level that <laughs> was almost, would be embarrassing to then talk about. But because of like this the motif of like the father daughter, and then there's like the baby. Yeah. Father, baby aspect, and all this stuff, and yeah, I mean, I've been, I've always been pretty emotional when it comes to cinema. It's one of the one things that, done correctly, can just get me. You know, I don't know if you guys have ever seen um, uh, La Bamba, Lou Diamond Phillips. <laughs> Every time that movie ends, and um, <laughs> the the mother, I forget. Her. The actress is like Connie something. Anyway, she says that she throws out the laundry in here. Not my Richie, not my Richie. And every time that happens, I just you know start just crying like a schoolgirl. Um, so I've always been emotionally affected by cinema, especially when it's done right. But yes, yeah, since certainly since becoming a father, it's the littlest things that will um, ignite that and just be like, oh my god, no, I can't. <laughs> It's a disaster. See, and it is embarrassing, especially in, if you're in a cinema. Because I like to go to the cinema on my own. I've always liked to go to cinema on my own. I like to be sat around people who are, you know, f- friends who are like, that's that guy from that movie. And I'm like, shut your face. We'll talk about this at the end of the film. <laughs> um, I like to watch movies on my own. I like to digest them on my own. Um, but yeah, when you're in a movie theater on your own you're, and you're, you're crying, <laughs> So, it's pretty embarrassing sometimes. Uh, oh, that's great. Um, I guess going into the horror genre itself, and because I know you love all types of movies, but like, what specifically about that genre was it that kind of drew you? Because again, and you even worked with the Mad Monster, which you mentioned conventions. And we'll get to that more, but like, why or? Well, I guess it started off, you know, in England, we have a very different, um, uh, I guess, um, certification system. Um, so in the 80s, when I was growing up, um, <clears throat> a lot of the movies that you guys, you know, probably grew up watching, movies like The Exorcist and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they were banned. We couldn't watch them. So they became almost mythical, you know. We'd see the, I'd know about them, and you know, my my mum, for example, would tell me when she watched The Exorcist. Now, you know, it made her extremely upset because I, I grew up as a Catholic as well. You know, I went to church and served as an altar, altar boy and all that stuff. So these movies became mythical to me. When the first time I ever watched The Exorcist, for instance, was on a pirated copy when I was like 13, 14 years old, so scratchy and you couldn't really make out what's happening, it just added to the experience so I think it was the, the thing that introduced me to horror would have been, I, I guess my local VHS shop you know, you, when you used to rent video tapes back in the day um, and you just see these incredible artworks in these VHS covers, you know, for like the Evil Dead and you'd be like, what the this looks amazing. I just, I want to know everything about what this is. And often, you know, a lot of these horror movies that would come out in the 80s and the early 90s were incredibly disappointing, but they would have such amazing, <laughs> elaborate artwork on the uh, VHS covers that you'd just be enchanted and intrigued by them. So I guess that was it, you know. It was that mystique and the, the fact that my mum, you know, was always like, no, you can't, you can't watch that. I was like, well, I'm going. <laughs> so, you know, sneaking around and watching horror movies late at night became a, a kind of a thing. So it's always that, um, I guess, uh, just being disobedient and breaking the rules. Of the, the horror genre that appealed to me. Okay. And then, so that moved into, you were talking about kind of helping set up Mad Monster and I kind of wanted to get into, um, we talked a little bit about you know, all of these horror film festivals that have been popping up lately. Um, and 
re or in episodes, but we also kind of wanted to discuss the idea of the horror convention and the you know kind of scenes part because you know every major city now seems to have their own horror convention. So you know, what went into that or yeah just some of the behind what it really encompasses and being a part of that. Yeah, well, initially, Bad Monster is like, I, I mean, it, the, the, the guy who created it will definitely try and attribute it to a community of people, but I can really only attribute it to him because he is um, a remarkable mind. Uh, it's a guy called Evan, Evan McGar. They had their latest convention, their kind of flagship show in um, North Carolina this weekend, actually, and they had people like Carl Weathers and Edward Furlong. Um, they had a reunion for like the cast of Scream. I think Nev Campbell was there. I don't really attend them anymore because you know being a father doesn't really allow for it. Um, but Evan is one of these guys who uh, just thinks outside of the box. And that's one of the greatest things I've ever taken from him. Is he has this ability to take something, see its popularity, and then say, "Okay, what would make it even better?" and he just thinks outside the box. So initially, I got working with him through a Craigslist ad. I think I saw a Craigslist ad when I first moved out to Los Angeles, and they were looking for people to help out in the office. And I uh, responded, and I, I actually spent a bit of time, you know, composing an email, and they saw it, and they were impressed, they brought me in, and it kind of grew from there. And it got to the point where they started setting up these conventions and they became really successful and conventions were a, a, a lot of fun you know i've got to, i've got to say initially you know when i went to the first one i was meeting people like brad DeReef and um, you know danny glover these people i grew up watching i'm you know getting to spend time intimate time with them you know william shannon i mean the, the guy's a complete legend to me um so it was completely overwhelming in a lot of respects that I'm, you know, even in the same room as these guys, because it's one thing, you know, a celebrity, you know, a guy who played Doctor Who in, you know, the eighties, for example, is something else. Me and Brad DeReef, you know, this guy's from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Charles Play, but he's a screen legend. So, um, you know, I was, I was really enamoured by that whole scene to begin with. Um, but equally, like the convention scene is very, what 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 I found was it's very kind of close knit, and everybody knows each other, and it's always the same vendors, and within that, there's a lot of personalities, a lot of egos, a lot of dramas which come from that. So, yeah, and I decided to take a kind of a step back away from that just because you know it wasn't really for me. It's not. The, I'm more interested in creating stories and. You know, where it is cool to, you know, spend five minutes with Brad Tariq and, you know, ask him a, a stupid question. My whole thing is like, I'd like to work with him maybe one day, you know, or, you know, to share a scene with him. <clears throat> so that became more of a, you know, thing for me. And that's why I've kind of um, taken a back step from what they do. But they continue to do the conventions and they continue to be successful. But I know there's a lot of, you know, dramas within them so <laughs> yeah. so with that and then everything that you're doing kind of how do you keep going kind of in between the project After that will kind of go into I guess, how that you know as you're a little bit older and as wiser and have been doing this for a while I think, I mean, like, it's, it's a constant hustle, being me, but maybe it's just a constant hustle for everybody at our kind of, you know, stages in the entertainment industry, because we, unless you're in it, you're on the fringes, and being on the fringes is frustrating, because you're just watching all these other people kind of come up, and sometimes it's, you know, less talented people, and people aren't saying things as, you know, profound as you might want to say <clears> them, um, so yeah, you just you. It, I mean, I think I 
personally have made a peace with that where I'm just like I know that my big break could come tomorrow I know that it could come next year but still I believe in myself enough to think that there will be a big break somewhere along the line so yeah again it goes back to that thing what I was talking about perseverance believing in yourself um, and not taking it too seriously you know just before Christmas I got um, I went for an audition for the new movie uh, with Dwayne Johnson, Gail Gatto, Ryan Reynolds. The audition went great. The cast director phoned my agent afterwards. They said, is he available on this date? I said, absolutely. And then that date came and went. I didn't hear another thing. And that's the frustrating thing because you know it went well. You know they liked you, but they don't have the decency to kind of like say, you know what, it's, we're going to go with someone else or we decided to cut that scene. You don't know what happened, so you're just left in this like weird limbo of like, fucking give me a scene with Gal Gadot. That's what I want. You know, that would be fantastic. You, you do get to the point where it's like, I understand it's not, it's not personal. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the more you kind of understand that about the industry um, and just keep in mind your, the end goal and that's why I always say to anybody who's interested in the creative industry, create your own work create your own work don't rely on other people, go out, shoot things, write stories make things yourself because if you create your own work and it's successful then people are going to start knocking on your door and they're going to start trying to endorse you and they're going to start saying oh can you advertise my product because what you do is great and then you know you don't have to go through all the knocking on the door process and you know almost being like I'm really good at what I do but give me a chance you don't have to go through that process because people are going to come to you so yeah I mean that's what like I'm, I'm sure Kyle and Josh I've, I haven't even heard from you guys like you're <laughs> just sitting there kind of nodding <laughs> But I'm sure you, you're probably both in the industry as well. And I'm sure you're both, you know, creative minds. So, you know, we're, we're all in the same boat. We just got to kind of keep pushing, keep creating our own work and, and hope for the best. I'm just oh, yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? He said he's just fascinated I, listening to you. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we're all in the same boat, pretty much, trying to make it happen. Good. Well, I'm sure I'm, I'm glad I'm talking sense because for me, I'm kind of jet lagged and I have drunk half a bottle of red wine. <laughs> I'm glad I'm making sense. So, so I mean, what does the as we're nearing the end? What does the future lie? Or like, what projects are coming up, or is there anything you'd like to kind of? promote or talk about yeah i mean i, 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 I was I, craig sent me a script um maybe like a year and a half ago now a feature film that he wrote and i've only just got around to reading it i just i sent him an email and I told him that i read it last night and um it was it was it was wonderful without blowing craig's horn too much it was a really good script um that is where I believe my future lies, maybe in, you know, writing things that are going to lead to other things. So I think if you're writing screenplays, you're in a good position to kind of call the shots. Because if a screenplay is good enough and it gets sold, the studios then have to, you know, either do something with it or continue to pay you until they want to do something with it. Um, and that's just money, money, money. And while you're earning that money, you can continue to you know, do exciting things and take chances. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for the moment, my, I've got a, a feature film that I've been working on for a couple of years now, um, which is, a, without saying too much about it, it's, a, it's like a vampiric running man, oh. um, which I think has legs, you know, I think is an is a interesting place Um to go with the vampire genre, which is kind of in a little bit dead in the water of recent years, and it's always been a favourite of mine. I've always loved vampire movies for some reason. Um, so that is something I want to, you know, make sure is polished, and I want to push further and, and see where I can take it. Um, 
other than that, you know, just plodding along with the accent. Well, you're speaking their language, the ashes with a vampiric running man. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that sounds fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's definitely got something to it. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's as we go into the future, you know, you have to, like, think ahead, right? You have to always be, it's a chess game. Life is a chess game. So with that, you have to think six or seven steps ahead. So, you know, video gaming and immersive technology is getting more and more popular. Um, going to the movies is not, you know, and it's just not because the movies aren't great anymore. It's just people don't want to go because they can you know, sit in the comfort of their own home and speak to people on the other side of the world like we're doing now and, you know, play video games or watch movies and, and do what they like. So I think... You know, what I was intending with the, the, I call it Outrun the Sun. That's my vampiric running man. It's called Outrun the Sun. And uh, I wanted to, to do this across all platforms, do a, a movie, a spin-off TV show, immersive live entertainment, theatre, video games. Um, and then just, you know, like a year after I came up with that concept and had been fine-tuning it. I noticed recently that Elo, I think it was Elo Roth, has announced that he's going to be doing something extremely similar. So uh, I was like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> um, but that's always the way. It's, it's about the way you do it. Um, a few years ago, I'm not sure if you guys know, but out in Los Angeles, there was something called the Tension Experience. I don't know if you ever heard about this. It was created by the guy who did um, Saw... One of the saw movies, I think it was Saw Three. Darren, is it Darren Bossman? Yeah, yeah, I think he did Saw Two and Three. Okay, yeah. yeah. So he created this. It was like immersive theatre, um, and there was a bunch of kind of puzzles and things beforehand. Um, but I signed up to it. I paid money and I took part in it, and it really was quite a unique, incredible experience where I literally got kidnapped in downtown Los Angeles. And put on this really weird roller coaster ride, which involved all these actors, and, um, some of which that I found out afterwards actually knew me personally. And they were like, Oh, yeah, we were told we can't get involved with you personally because you know, it would ruin the whole experience for you. But they were watching me from you know, cameras and stuff. <clears throat> um, and I've done a couple of them as well. And I think there's, there's, there's a lot to be said about this, and essentially, it's giving people an experience you know it's just what i always say about when I, I i give tours of the chinese theater i say to people that when you watch a movie in this room you're not going to forget the experience you know the chinese theater in hollywood if you guys have ever been it's this incredible grand old movie palace it's been there since 1927 and you can feel when you walk in the room the people that have been inside it before you I'm talking about Charlie Chaplin right up to Leonardo DiCaprio. They've all been there. Um, and a lot of, you know, the entertainment experience nowadays is missing that sense of experience, missing that sense of wonder. It's designed for you to, you know, click onto the next episode or to watch a movie. And so, you know, after becoming a father, I decided that. I was only going to seek out stuff that was exceptional. I was only going to give my time to stuff that was considered by, you know, critiques, or, you know, friends, valued friends to be exceptional because I don't have the time for stuff that's, you know, just, yeah, it's okay. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to watch something that's five-star entertainment and I'm going to decide whether or not I think it's five-star entertainment. Um, so, yeah, I can't even remember what your original question was. <laughs> well, that was perfect. Um, as we're wrapping up now, is there, because part of our the podcast we'll deal with like the obscure and the independent, and um, so is there any type of, any movies that are your go-to recommendations and ones that are obscure that maybe people don't, haven't really heard of that you are the ones you are champion, championing that you would really like to 
recommend the people out here? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've really, like, over the last few years, I've enjoyed Ari Aster's stuff. You know, Craig and I have spoken about Hereditary and um, Midsommar. I thought they were just excellent. You know, because you've got different you got different styles of movies coming out nowadays. You've got, you know, popcorn nonsense. I mean, for me, like, It, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 were just unnecessary. <laughs> I sat there for, what was it, six hours of my life I dedicated to the, both those films. And by the end of it, I was just like, Ugh, I'd rather watch the Tim Curry. Maybe that's just nostalgia, or maybe it's just they weren't that great. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, you have this popcorn culture where if you're not being entertained every five seconds, you know, you're looking at your phone. Um, and that's, that's a, that's a bad place to be. You know, that's part of the reason why I don't let my daughter watch any TV. And, you know, I'm all about books with her. We sit down and we read a lot. Um, because using your imagination is, is, is key to entertainment. I think. I don't want to be given the whole story when I watch something. I want to be able to make up some of it myself and make my own decisions. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> the work of Ari Aster, I love what uh, Robert Eggers is doing. Um, you know, The Witch and The Lighthouse, I both really enjoyed. A few years ago, there's a movie, it might have been just after I moved back to LA, around 2011. This guy is called... Uh, they made a movie called Bellflower. I'm not sure if you ever saw that. Mm-hmm. Really weird, obscure little film. Kind of in the horror genre, but not really. It was it was a strange movie. But you know what? I encourage you guys to seek it out because it was um, totally unique. And they shot it on a number of different cameras with different films and stuff. And I, I went and caught it in the silent movie theater. And I was just thinking at the time, these guys are going to do exciting stuff but they never really got the recognition i think that they deserve to get off the off the back of that film so yeah i'm going to start talking about the movie a lot more to people and encourage them to seek it out it's a hard one to find i think but it's called bellflower and it's uh it's an interesting one to look at and um so how can people follow you on your social media well, yeah, I mean, I kind of deleted all this. <laughs> Every time I go on social media, uh, I just feel like it's like soul crushing and bothers day. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be part of this. Either. So um, if you're interested, you can Google uh, Morto, which is M O R T Z O. Um, and that's my songwriter name. You can find a bunch of my songs, and you'll probably you know, find a link to some way to contact me <laughs> thank you so much Peter and, um, yeah no it's been a blast and thanks for letting us have you especially being in the UK right now and dealing with the storms And yeah I mean guys it's, it's, it's an honour to chat to you and you know um, uh, Josh, Kyle, make sure you shoot me a Craig will give my email. Let's, let's keep in touch. We'll definitely hear more about you guys because I feel I've just kind of talked at you for however long we've been talking. But I'd love to hear more about what you guys are up to as well. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Thanks for coming on. Excellent, Jess. Well, listen, lovely yeah. to meet you. I'm going to go and get yeah. some sleep now, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Go for it. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Peter. For doing Take it. care. Thank you. Yeah. I'll talk to you later, man. Bloodhound Picks Podcast is produced by Josh Lee, Craig Dram, and Kyle Hintz. Music by Raymond Seed. Audio editing by Kyle Hintz.